Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about the use related risk analysis or URRA. And if this acronym sounds completely new to you, you can guess who might have created it. Uh, the FDA, one of the lovers of acronyms. A um, little joke that was told to me a long time ago was, um, do you know what a TLA is? TLA is the acronym for three-letter acronym. So any organization that creates an acronym for acronyms, they are going to create an acronym for just about everything you want. So use-related risk analysis, we have an acronym. It's a four-letter acronym. Use-related risk analysis is URRA, and the FDA wants you to include that in a 510K submission or Genovo to document your risk analysis for use-related risks. Um, for the human factor study that you're going to be doing. But a lot of companies use a very logical assumption that, hey, we can submit this um, in other formats. We could use a use FMEA, or we could use um, an application FMEA, or we could use some other format that would be in another standard, and that would be an acceptable approach because as long as you use a recognized standard and you explain what you did and it has the same information, why wouldn't the FDA accept that? And, oh, what if we add another column here and we have more information? That should be more is better, right? We'll give them all the things that they normally want, but we'll give them a couple extra things. Or maybe we'll take our normal FMEA and we'll add the columns that the FDA wants in a use FMEA in there as well. So it'll, it'll always have more. And they're wondering why they get back a response from the FDA, either in a pre-submission or in an actual submission as an additional information request or AI hold. They'll get a response back saying, you didn't provide a URRA. And then, but we did. We provided all the information you want. Every single column you asked for, it's there. It even has the same spelling. Can't you see it? Well, yes, they can see it, but that's not the point. In this video is about the misunderstanding about why they want a URRA. So when somebody at the FDA is doing a review of their section of the file, and they don't, they don't have one person reviewing the whole file, they have different departments reviewing their specialty. So there's a human factors expert or usability engineering expert that's reviewing the human factors section. And they're reviewing that documentation and they're seeing if it meets all the requirements. And it's one of the things they have to do is go through every single item that's identified as a critical task and say, um, did you do adequate validation for demonstrating that your risk controls um, prevent that uh, use-related risk from occurring? Number two, they're going to be looking at all your tasks and the way you scored those tasks to see if they agree with whether you wherever you said it's not a critical task, do they agree? So is it a is it a low risk and you said it's not a critical task and they disagree and they think it should have been a higher risk and should have been a critical task? That's one of the other things they're looking for. So they have to do this literally for every single line item in your risk analysis. Now, if you only have about five steps in your process, you have a very simple thing like open it up and, you know, connect to a needle and inject and then throw it out, well, maybe you could have a very short URRA. But most devices, especially software and electronic medical devices, they have lots of steps. Sometimes we have user manuals that are over 100 pages. So when you have long instructions and long, lots of steps to perform, you're going to have a lot of lines for the reviewer to, re, to review. So they want the absolute minimum that they need to do their job. So they're not saying, we don't want you to use a use FMEA of your design or an application in uh, FMEA or a U FMEA, whatever it is. They're not saying that. They're saying, we want you only to provide us in your submission this format. And we don't want to see the other stuff. Why? Because we only have so much time to review this and we want just the minimal information. So give us the user task, or, or first item is user re use related risk analysis task number. That's column number one. User task is column number two. Possible use errors is number three. 
Potential hazards and clinical harm is number four. Severity of harm is five. Critical tasks, yes or no, is six. Risk mitigation measures is seven. And the last column is validation method for effectiveness of risk and mitigation measure. They just want those columns, nothing more. They want them in that order. They want them, that wording. They don't care whether it's a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet, but they only want that information. And the reason why is it'll make it very easy for them to go line by line and make their assessment. And if everybody does it the same way, that that's important to streamline the process. Now, that doesn't mean that's all they want for use-related uh, documentation, period. They still want your use specification. They still want your task analysis. They still want your summative protocol. They still want your final report. They still want your raw data. And they want to know what measures you or what ta uh, activities you went through to identify the use-related risks out of the existing MOD database for your product and other similar products on the market. So all those things they also want, but for the specific use-related risk analysis, they only want this format because it gives them everything they want and it, they're using it as a traceability matrix in your summative protocol to making sure everything, every single thing was covered and anything that you scored as a non a critical task, they're reviewing that and saying, yes, I agree, no, I don't agree. How did I find this out? How does Rob have this massive, um, it, it was not It was not something that came to me in a dream. It's not something I speculated on. I had a pre-submission meeting with the FDA and I asked the person on the other end of the call, hey, by the way, I know you're the guy that has the PhD in human factors and you're the head of the group. Um, could you let me know why you want this format? Is it just you want something that says URA at the top? Um, you know, what we provided is basically all the things you wanted, but it had like one or two extra columns. Like we just want what we told you. We don't want anything more because it, we don't want extra information. It makes it too complicated for us to do this traceability to go through each one. It takes too long. I'm like, oh, now I get it. You just want to save time and effort because you have thousands of submissions to review each year. And it takes a long time to go through each one of these lines. I get it. Everybody use the same format. Everybody give me only what I asked for and exactly the order I asked for, labeled exactly this way. Got it. Understand. And I said, you know, it'd be really great if you had explained that in the draft guidance document from 2022. Then we wouldn't have made some incorrect assumptions. He's like, good point. And um, I was like, it'd also be really great if you did a training on this. And he's like, well, I have I have a, uh, a conference I got to present at in the near future. Maybe after that, we'll do a training on that. So maybe we'll get something in the future this year on explaining this particular topic directly from the FDA instead of from me. But I'm sharing the wealth with you here, a wealth of knowledge. It's a really simple concept. So there is nothing wrong with the way you've been doing your risk analysis. It's how how you're presenting it to the FDA. They want you to create a subset of that in, ex in especially the format they asked for and only the format they asked for for the risk analysis so they can quickly review every submission the same way and get their job done. That's all they're asking for. Now, it doesn't mean you don't need the other documents like I listed before. Use specification. You got to make sure you have that. Number two, you gotta you gotta go through all the mod database to NTPLC database, making sure you've identified all the use errors that could occur uh, for competitor products and yours. You want to also do a task analysis. You want to have your protocol. You want to have your final report. You want to have the raw data. Oh, and if you have feasibility data, I forgot. You need to provide a summary of the feasibility. I'm sorry, formative testing. If you did that formative testing, you gotta provide a summary of that. Not necessarily the full report. Not necessarily the um, the um, the protocol because it's not a required protocol format for formative testing, but um, a summary of it would be helpful. And even in the final report for your summative, they want to know how the um, the formative testing identified use errors that you may have modified the design in response to. So that's something else that they're looking for in the report. Um, so what are you supposed to do here? Um, you can create your own Excel spreadsheet. I created one. It took me five minutes, literally five minutes. It might even take me four. Um, I created an Excel. I even made it a different color header row. I made it all nice and neat and organized. I used the exact same spelling, exact 
capitals and in, in lowercase that the FDA did. And then I made a little note at the bottom. The FDA only wants the information in the URA for a submission in order to save reviewer time when verifying traceability for each critical task. Do not modify or add any information beyond what's in the draft guidance. And I even say in the little tab, URRA Table 2 of 2022 draft. So that's where it came from. No mystery. You can have as a Word document, you have an Excel spreadsheet, but that's what they want. And ultimately, you're going to convert that into a PDF uh, for the FDA. Now, um, if you don't have your own usability process, we have a usability procedure on our website. It's SYS48, and uh, it lists on the website all the things that are provided in there. I went in there and I took the URA example that we had and I changed it to be exactly what was in the draft guidance so there wouldn't be any issue. And I created a separate Excel version so you get both when you purchase it. So you can decide whether you want Excel or Word. Um, and if you want to convert one into uh, something in uh, Google or some other um, software tool, that's great. But just remember, only what they ask for, only in the order they ask for it, nothing more, nothing less or it will re be rejected because they got to do it all the same way to save themselves time and money. So that explains why they want you to use this template. And it's not in any other guidance. It's not, it's not in the um, IEC 62366. Um, so if you fall, if you have your own use FMEA or you have your own application FMEA, is that wrong? Absolutely not. You can still use that for European C marking and technical files, any other country. You can even show that to your FDA inspector that's coming to your facility and asking for your design history file and risk management file. But in the actual submission, they want you to condense what you have down to only these documents. And um, what would be really helpful is if they went the next level of detail like they did um, for cybersecurity and software, and they had an attachment for each line item. Um, so number one, give me that use spec. And, and then next to that, they had the little question mark with the blue square, and you click on that for the help, and it popped up an example of what we need. That would be awesome. Um, will I get that? Probably not. <laughs> but that would be awesome if I have an updated usability guidance. So I'm not looking at the 2016 guidance, and I was looking at um, if I, I could click on that, it would give me an example of what it looks like, and it'd give me a hyperlink to the guidance document, and it would tell me what it, it wants for each attachment. That would be awesome. Um, one other thing, if, you know, if this is Christmas and I'm, and I'm asking for my, uh, you know, asking for the, some wizard to give me my wish, I would love to see something specific says, is this an over-the-counter product, yes or no? And if I click over the counter, and it could be also both. So yes, no, both. Um, if it's both or it's over the counter, then I should have additional items that it's requesting. So one of the things that the FDA has been asking for is they want um, the ability to uh, self-select. Uh, so some sort of self-selection questionnaire. So lay persons that are both the intended user and not the intended user they want both to identify whether this product's for them when they see it on the shelf in Walmart or wherever. And number two, after you've got that self-selection survey, they also want to see a reading comprehension study. And for anybody that's seen me talk about reading comprehension studies before, that there are two challenging pieces to a reading comprehension study. Finding people that have a lower level of education that doesn't mean they're illiterate or they're uneducated. It means they just don't have a college education. They have um, secondary school. So they went to high school and they have that level of education. So that's the hardest group to find. There are lots of people that have more than that, but there's very few people there out there that are going to answer your questions and do this study and only have a high school education. It's a smaller subset, uh, subset of the population. So they're kind of hard to find. And then the second group that's hard to find is people that are older. And when I say older, like 55, 65, I'm almost a 55 myself. But when you get older, um, those people are not, we're just not taking our time to answer your questions.
questionnaires. We don't care. <laughs> so it's not that we don't know how to answer it. We have a lot of really smart people out there in their 60s and 70s that can work computers just fine, but we don't have the time or desire to answer your questionnaires and participate in your special studies. Um, and we're probably not your target market either. Um, there are certain people that are your target market for a lot of products in that population. The older people, the, the whatever your co age cohort is the oldest and whatever your education cohort that has the least uh, education, those two cohorts are hardest to recruit in a reading comprehension study. And those are the ones that the FDA wants most, of course. Uh, so you have new technology. They want somebody that represents the older population because they have harder time adopting the technology is the premise. Whether it's true or not is irrelevant. Um, and then the second piece is people that have less education, presumably have a lower reading level, even though uh, I would challenge most people to keep up with my 11-year-old in reading. Uh, I can't even read as fast as she does, and I write for a living. So you know, it, it's not saying bad things about those populations. It's just the hardest to recruit for. So if you're doing a usability study, if, we're, if we get a chance to give the FDA our feedback on a draft guidance, um, as soon as they publish that, I'm going to type in my comments. Here's what I want to see. I want to see the um, E-Star updated with a usability section. I can even lay it out for them and send it off to Patrick Axto and Lily. Say, this is what we want. And um, I want a, a button for each of the attachments. I want a little help button where it tells me what it's supposed to look like, points me to the section of the guidance. And then I want something that's a yes, no, both for OTC, and then it points to me what I'm looking for for both of those. And then I think that would eliminate a lot of the questions on usability. But um, since that magical e-start does not exist yet, maybe it'll be version 7.0. We're on 5.0 now. Um, for now, I'm just pointing you in the right direction for use-related risk analysis. Only give the FDA the columns that they want, organize the way they asked, word for word what they asked, don't overthink it. Yes, it means creating another document. You can't just rely on what's in your use, usability engineering file. You have to create a special document for the FDA. But this will not be the only special document you have to create for the FDA. They have their guidance documents. They want it a certain way. And it streamlines their review timeline. Um, Europe is the same way. They have their own special documents. You have to have a, a general safety and protection um, checklist, a GSPR checklist. Um, you also have to have a declaration of conformity. You also have to have a postmark or clinical follow-up plan. There are all these things that they have that are specific to Europe. They're not different they, or they're not um, special at the FDA. They are the only ones that want you to do something specific for them. Um, every regulator has something specific they want their way and deal with it. <laughs> That's my final message. Just deal with it, give them what they want, and you will be happier. Uh, I hope that helps everybody. If you have any comments down below, your own suggestions, wish list uh, for what's welcome, uh, please don't hesitate to put it down there. I do know that from time to time, people like Patrick take a look at my, my YouTube and uh, make comments. So if you have your own comments, don't hesitate to put them down there. Maybe you'll see them and maybe we'll get something that we wish for in the future. Uh, but I hope this helps everybody and looking forward to your comments. See you next Friday and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.